Ted Jones designed and built the slow motion driven by Stan Sayers. It was not a jet boat, but a prop rider, where the rear of the boat lifts completely out of the water and rides on the spinning propeller, reducing friction enormously. The slow motion was extremely successful. The first thing it tried to do was break the straightaway speed record that Malcolm Campbell had, and they were able to break the record by 20 miles an hour. The slow motion four captured the world speed record at 160 miles per hour on June 26, 1950. Again, the spirited competition between England and America heated up as the current land speed record holder, John Cobb, took to the water. The latest challenger to the world's water speed record held at the moment by America is the new British jet engine ski boat Crusader. Britain's latest jet boat will be getting its first try out at Loch Ness. He had one very successful run at Loch Ness where he went through the traps at over 280 miles an hour. On his return run, the forward planing surface of the boat collapsed and the boat disintegrated and Cobb was killed immediately. After Cobb's destruction, another Englishman came forward to challenge the mercurial, murderous waters. Donald Campbell came by his quest naturally. He was practically born into the high-speed game as the son of Malcolm Campbell. He literally was bitten by a speed bug, if there is such a thing. He was just there for the, the thrill of the speed. And I think when my grandfather died, um, the Americans were again looking at wanting to break the water speed record, which was his father's. And he just dug his heels in and thought, well, it's my father's record and I'm here to, to carry on. For whatever reason people tempt death, Campbell decided to go after the water speed record with a jet-powered boat. Cobb, despite his gruesome death, proved that jet engines were the key to a major leap in speed. And he worked with two young designers, Ken and Lewis Norris, and they put together a plan for the Bluebird K7. It was to be put around the jet, it was to be virtually an airplane. Now, when Bluebird K7 first got on top, when I saw this boat get onto the top of the water, I just had to turn away. I couldn't actually look at it at all. And it was such an emotion. It's on and it's going fast and, I, and I'm party to this. My brother and I have done this. The Norris brothers and Donald Campbell created the Bluebird K7. The 26-foot all-metal craft had a distinctively unique shape and featured the three-point hydroplane system. It was powered by a turbojet engine that delivered 4,000 pounds of thrust. Like our Wood and Joe Carstairs, Donald Campbell always carried with him a good luck mascot. His was a single teddy bear named Mr. Wappet. In July of 1955, Donald Campbell and Mr. Wappet brought his Bluebird K7 to 202 miles per hour. He reclaimed for his family and his country the title of fastest man on water. Bit by bit, over the next nine years, Campbell pushed his speed up to 260 miles per hour. Another challenger came forward, again from America. After making his mark in drag boat racing, Lee Taylor had a boat built around a jet engine. It was called the Hustler. Taylor was ready to run in 1964. He was running on Lake Havasu in April when the throttle failed to close down after a run. Taylor was faced with two options. Did he stay with the boat, which was quite clearly going to run out of water, or did he bail out? Well, I've sat in that boat, and I don't understand how the guy managed to bail out, but bail out he did. Taylor was injured jumping out of the boat, but worse was to follow, because when the Coast Guard put him on the stretcher, somehow the stretcher began to slide on the rock, the result of which was that the helicopter was destabilized and also crashed. So for the second time in as many minutes, Lee Taylor had a serious accident and was being rescued. Ironically, Hustler was virtually undamaged. If Taylor had stayed with the boat, he would certainly have fared better. Instead, Lee Taylor had to spend the next 18 months learning again how to walk and talk. 
but he would return to the great water speed chase. With the end of 1964 approaching, Donald Campbell pushed the Bluebird K-7 to another new world record of 276 miles per hour. Donald Campbell was exactly the same character as his father, and no sooner had he succeeded at something than he became dissatisfied with that success. His next goal was to top 300 miles per hour, but there was more at stake than mere records. Financial solvency was at risk, as well as life and limb. The world of record-breaking went to a dip at that time. You couldn't get sponsorships at, at all, it was in. In order to regain the media spotlight and the financial support of backers, Campbell felt that he must break the 300-mile-an-hour limit. He took a team and the Bluebird K-7 up to Lake Coniston in the middle of November. Bad weather and mechanical difficulties with a new jet engine prevented anything worthwhile from happening. Time was running out. Finally, after New Year's, the water and the weather conditions seemed right. However, for the obsessively superstitious Campbell, there was a troubling omen. The night before the run, he was playing solitaire, and he turned up in succession the Ace of Spades and the Queen of Spades. And he commented to the people there in the room that this is the very hand that Mary, Queen of Scots, turned up the night before she was executed, and that someone in his family was going to die tomorrow. Uh, I think he used the word, someone's going to get the chop tomorrow. I hope it's not me. Campbell was finally ready on January the 4th, and on his first run, he achieved 297 miles an hour, three miles an hour below his target speed. So he turned around with an empty boat, ran down that lake, reached a speed of 320 miles an hour. The boat lifted, looped the loop, and with Campbell commenting, I've got the bows up, I've gone, oh, it crashed into the water. Campbell's body was never found, probably because it disintegrated with the boat. They found his socks, his shoes, they even found his teddy bear. The feeling is that Campbell took a calculated risk that went wrong. It was something that he simply went out, I think, in a bloody-minded mood, saying, today's the day we do it, let's get it done. It was a calculated risk that sadly didn't come off. With Donald Campbell's death a daily reminder and his own earlier accident, Lee Taylor continued to push towards 300 miles per hour. The Hustler was repaired and ready to go. In June of 1967, Taylor finally topped Campbell with a speed of 285 miles per hour, still shy of 300. But now the fastest man on water was an American. But stories swirled around Taylor's new record. It was widely reported that because of his earlier near fatal crash, Taylor was shy about using the boat's full power and that his crew tricked him into reaching record-breaking speeds by changing the throttle settings in the boat and the floats marking the distance on the course. The people I've talked to, his manager at the time, all of them deny knowing anything about it. So even if it's true, I think it's understandable with what the guy had been through. But knowing his character, I don't give too much credence to that story. It was another 10 years before someone came along to take Taylor's title, someone with a lifelong love of water, someone far away in Australia. He is the Horatio Alger of the water speed record, a self-made man who accomplished the impossible on water and lived to tell about it. The water exerts a powerful and consistent pull over mankind. In Australia, one native son pursued his childhood dream obsessively. Ken Warby was gripped by the challenge of the water speed record and filled with admiration for those who came before him. 
The early uh, guys in Unlimited were definitely my heroes. I could see these guys going out and going where no man had ever gone before, and that was a challenge. And, you know, in life there are not many challenges left. There are not too many unknowns that you can step into. But it was always the mechanical challenge. It's the achievement of designing the best mousetrap. From the beginning, Morby was an eager boat builder. He's characteristically frank about his first boat, built at the age of 16. It was a terrible boat. It was an absolutely terrible boat. The design was terrible, the method of building it was bad, and I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. But Warby was pissed and learned from his mistakes. Then, in the late 60s, a friend told him about an auction the Australian Air Force was holding to get rid of outdated jet engines. Warby bought two for $100 each, and then a third for $65. He now had the key ingredient to make an attempt to reach his dream. And once I got those, one Saturday night, I sat down on the kitchen table and designed Spirit of Australia. And the whole drawing was just a pencil sketch on a 30 by 20 piece of paper, a plan elevation, the rest was just in the brain. No shop at all, uh, just pure backyard, jet engines laying in the dirt, kids playing on them, neighbours looking over the fence, absolutely amazed at what I was doing, thinking I was quite nuts. Well, I had uh, some of three electric power tools, and, you know, it was called the impossible dream, and I had all the sceptics in the world out there that were giving me a hard time, saying, oh, you can't do it, this will never work. While his doubters were legion, Warby persisted. Little by little, he built up his speed and made adjustments to the boat, continually refining the design. Amazingly, Warby built his boat not from some exotic space-age material, but from something once alive, wood. And when it came time to go for the official record, Warby always had help. Volunteers who donated their time to make the impossible happen. Finally, on November 20th, 1977, at Blowering Dam, Warby was ready to go for the record. After sleeping in his car to save hotel money in order to buy plywood, enduring mechanical setbacks and the jeers of universal doubters, Ken Warby drove his spirit of Australia and broke Taylor's record by just over three miles an hour. but Warby's biggest fan didn't watch. I think the nicest benefit was my mum saw it before she died. Convinced that he can break through the elusive 300 mile per hour barrier, Warby planned to return a year later. It's supposedly the most dangerous sport on earth with the death rate that it's got. But you know, this has been a life passion it's, it's not just somebody that said, hey, I got a jet engine, I'm gonna break the world speed record. The second time around, now as the world water speed record holder, Warby had the assistance of the Australian Air Force, who helped him tune his boat's jet engine to its peak level. Less than a year after setting the record, Warby broke through the elusive barrier, a barrier that had already claimed more than one life. On October 8, 1978, Warby became the first man to top 300 miles an hour on the water and live. You know, people uh, say, well, you know, what's it feel like at 300 mile an hour? Well, you explain sex to me and then I'll be able to tell you what 300 mile an hour is. People who understand the true level of achievement are in short supply. Warby was the first and only person in history to design, build, and drive a boat to a world speed record, the undisputed fastest man on water. Why do people climb the mountains? You know, the mountains are there to be climbed, records are made to be broken, and it's a matter of uh, personal achievement. The speed record. I'd like to call out. Former record holder Lee Taylor mounted a new challenge to Warby Sandy. His boat was a Discovery II, a reverse three-pointer similar in design to John Cobb's disastrous Crusader. Powered by a hydrogen peroxide rocket motor, 
Taylor was testing the $2.5 million boat at speeds above 260 miles per hour on November 13, 1980, when it corkscrewed, crashed, and disintegrated. Taylor's body, like so many others who tempted the gods of speed, was never found. Another seeker of speed thrills and a claimant to the legacy of Gar Wood is Gold Cup champion Dave Bilwa. His Miss Budweiser, a super fast turbine powered unlimited hydroplane, races on an oval course at blistering speeds over 200 miles per hour. It's a challenging medium, you know, much like a mountain is to climb, really to, to operate one of these boats at 200 miles an hour over this type of terrain. It's a real challenge for both the crews and the driver. It brings out the best in all of us, I think. The competitors, to me, are really what makes the race worthwhile. You know, not racing just against the clock, but racing against the competitor. There have been two more official attempts. Both were disasters. Lee Taylor was determined to reclaim the title. He built the first ever rocket-powered boat, Discovery 2, and took it to Lake Tahoe. Repeat. How is your line on the course? Obnoxious. Tighten shoulder harness. Tightened. Indicate when ready. I'm waiting, but the engine's not. It's cooking like hell. Fire one ready, camera on. There's very little surface contact. It doesn't take very much air or a slight lump in the water to change your angle of attack, and your boat once it lifts its nose, lets air under the front, it just keeps blowing it over. That's the biggest danger. He hit a wave, the boat jumped up, it started rocking violently, and he just started to get sponsored walking very badly and just disintegrated. As he approached 270 miles per hour, the boat broke in two. Taylor's body went 300 feet down to the bottom of the lake. Nine years later, in 1989, Craig Arfons took up the challenge in Florida. He was a drag racer, unfamiliar with the dangers of extreme speed over water. He reached the awesome speed of 370 miles per hour but then his boat went out of control. Another life lost to the water speed record.